Mm. Welcome to Fame Bible <laughs> Time. We're on page 178. We're looking at the perfection of God. God's perfection. Um, this is interesting, and because it's like it's, it's it's very slightly different to his omniscience and his omnipotence. It's another subtle difference, but quite an important difference for us to give a little time to. It's a short one, but I think you'll find this is wonderful. Let's pray and we'll get into it. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for opportunities like this to think about you, who you are, what you're like. Please give us understanding. Please give us insight. Please help us to to learn how to trust you for who you are in Jesus name. Amen. Yeah. All right. So we're talking about God's perfection. It says here the perfection of God speaks not only of his moral perfection that that is that he is perfectly holy, just and good, but also that God is the sum total of all conceivable perfections. How about that? Mm. The sum total of all conceivable perfections. Not just in terms of his goodness, not just moral perfection, mm. holiness and so on, but, but all perfections. Now, mm. We've been thinking about these attributes of God as, as kind of aspects of his perfection. We sometimes considered them as, as his perfections, the things in which he is perfect. That's interesting, isn't it? Well, this is kind of taking all of that and, and saying, okay, well, now let's, let's think about this as a whole, and, and what have you got? Well, you've got the fact that God is, is like the, con it's like if you put together all the possible perfections into one, that's God's perfection, okay? So let's think about that. Um, a few scriptural evidences for it. Number one, we're talking about God's greatness, in its totality beyond it being beyond human discovery. Now, you know, these mm. scriptures, Psalm 145, verse 3, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. But the next line, his greatness is, let's hear it, unsearchable. Oh, oh, hold on a minute. His greatness is unsearchable searchable what does unsearchable mean it's like the bottomless sea you can't you can't find the bottom um and the other one Isaiah 40 verse 28 have you not known have you not heard the lord is the everlasting god the creator of the ends of the earth he does not grow faint or grow weary he does not faint or grow weary he doesn't yawn either. Um, his understanding is, here it is again, unsearchable. His greatness is unsearchable. His understanding is unsearchable. That's really quite something, isn't it? It's like the universe itself. Do you need pens? I should just buy you a set of pens and tie them to the Bible in front of you. Um... It, it is something, isn't it? The universe, they keep, every, every, every time they think they've kind of found how big the universe is, they build a bigger telescope. And then they focus in on a little bit of dark space. Mm. And then they zoom in a bit more, and then they zoom in a bit more, and it turns out that in that little dark patch that they thought maybe was a black hole or something, it just turns out that there's a whole galaxy or a gazillion galaxies stuck in that little spot of space and and suddenly space gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it's just mm. like can, can we ever find the end of it that's interesting isn't it 
As if, if God made the heavens to tell us something about himself, which Psalm 119 tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God. And when you, when you start thinking about that, you, re, you realize, hang on a minute, this is telling us God is just unsearchably great. Mm -hmm. Unsearchably great. All right. And that number two, God's mercy towards those who fear him is greater than man's perception. Psalm 103, verse 11, as high, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. How high are the heavens above the earth? <laughs> you can't figure that out, can you? And, and that's so great is his steadfast love. This is just incredible, isn't it? Number three, God's work is perfect in that his acts are perfectly truthful and just. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, the rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. So his work is perfect. No, you know, I'm sitting at the table with two artists, and one thing about artists, it's a little bit like preachers, whatever we produce, we see terrible faults in. <laughs> you just can't, you just like, everything you do is faulty, not God. Imagine that. Imagine being able to do something, anything, and actually say it's perfect. Mm -hmm. But then imagine everything that God does is perfect. Now, I mean, people have immediate objections to this. Well, what about the existence of sin in the world and so on? Yeah, but the story's not finished yet, is it? Mm. The painting can look very, very messy. Mm -hmm whilst it's being painted. Mm, You've true. seen those time lapses, haven't mm. you, on, on YouTube? I mean, it's just some artist throwing stuff at a canvas and it really just looks terrible and you're like, what is he doing? And then eventually you step back or he turns it upside down or something incredible and you're like, wow! Or this, suddenly this cityscape appears and you realise that the the things you thought were just splashes are actually light shining out of windows and it's just amazing. And you say, wow. Well, listen, God is making the wow. And the mess in the middle is, is, is part of that. But that doesn't mean his ways are not perfect. It doesn't mean his works are not perfect. All right, number four, God's way is perfect. We talked about his works, now his way. And this is precious, isn't it? Um, 2 Samuel 22, verse 31. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Okay. Mm -hmm. His way is perfect. I love this. Mm -hmm. I love it. Why? Because I have to go through stuff, and you have to go through stuff, which is painful, right? I mean, but, but in the middle of painful experiences, I get comfort thinking God's way is perfect. Um, what was the, the song that we were singing to ourselves earlier today? What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. Um, what is our only confidence? Uh, that our souls to him belong. But then there's that, that line which, um, what comes apart from his command? What a comfort. You know, when you think his way is perfect, and, and you think, okay, what, what, what comes in life apart from his command? And his way is perfect. So look, this is happening right now and it's really painful and I don't like it, but God's not messing it up. Mm -hmm. God isn't making a mistake. You've got to believe this. 
This is the perfection of God. Finally, I mean, obviously, this is the one people go to naturally. Maybe, by the way, maybe you're doing, like, it seems like Harris is doing, you're kind of creating your own cross-reference system for this systematic theology as we go. It's so helpful to have this in your Bible. But maybe, what you, I'll tell you what I did when I was in seminary, when I was studying all of this, is I, because we had to be able to, answer questions on any of these issues in order to be ordained as a, as a minister at Grace Community Church. I had to go into a room with some of the pastors <laughs> and just be ready to answer questions. I mean, just like any question. And they could ask you something like, you know, tell me about, um, I don't know, uh, what the Bible says about marriage and divorce and remarriage. I mean, there's, there's a lot in the Bible about marriage and divorce and remarriage. Let me tell you my trick for, for kind of learning my way around those things was to, to say, okay, I'm going to have one verse that I go to, mm -hmm. which is like my main verse. Um, for, for marriage, divorce, and remarriage. So like in my case, that would be like Matthew 19. It's a very obvious passage. Jesus answers a question and deals with it. And so you go there, but then when you... That's like your starting place for that topic in the Bible. And then I would list my cross-references from there. And then I'd go to the other places and I'd list the cross-references there. Deuteronomy chapter 24, and I'd be in Deuteronomy 24, and, and, and then maybe I'd write down, okay, Ephesians 5, and 1 Corinthians 7, and, and so I've got these little lists of cross-references in different places in my Bible. Now, as you then keep reading through the Bible as the years go by, you come across one passage, but then in the margin, you've got all these other passages cross-referenced. That's what you can do here. Now, what I would do, if I'm looking to create a cross-reference system for God's perfections, is I'd go to Matthew 5.48. Why? Because in Matthew 5.48, it says, You therefore must be, what? Perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So there's the word twice. Now, this is the Sermon on the Mount. We're talking about God's perfections. If you wanted one verse to say God is perfect, mm -hmm. this is the verse, isn't it? But you could start there and you could what create... Matthew 548. Um, you could start there and then you could create your kind of mental or physical in your Bible cross-reference system and you could go to these other... Like Psalm 145, Psalm 103, Isaiah 40, Deuteronomy 32, 1 Samuel 22. And once you've got a few of these cross-referenced within your Bible, each time you read through your Bible, which I hope you do every year, you'll come across your own cross-references. You'll look them up and you'll go, oh yeah, that's part of this. You're building your own mental mm -hmm. spider's web of <laughs> theology. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a little tip on the side. Um, now, obviously, Matthew 5.48 is talking about morality. And the context there says that. But it's the verse that actually says God is perfect. The Father is perfect. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, that's good. Do you like that? What does it feel like to be perfect? Okay. No idea. <laughs> okay. What does it feel like when you do something and it's like just the way you wanted it to be done? Mm -hmm. What does it feel like? Good. Good. What does it make you feel? Happy. Happy, happy right. So this is one of those things. It's very interesting if you read the rest of this section. Um, that is linked to the what is called the blessedness of God, God's blessedness, God's happiness, the fact that God is happy. What? How do you how do you picture God? Do you picture God in heaven as kind of 
um, a bit like sour on on top of um, what's the tower Baradur. Uh, what's the number of tower that Sauron? Or think? Is it Or think? No. What's the tower that? I don't know, but my brain is still working. Saruman. I don't mean Sauron. Oh, Saruman's Sar on the tower. Of Orthanc. Saruman is on the tower of Orthanc. So do you picture? Do you remember that scene where he's kind of looking over the edge and he's like, "Oh, it's all going wrong." Mm -hmm. Remember that scene? Mm -hmm. um, is that how you picture God? He's like, he's up in heaven and he's looking down and he's like, "Oh, oh look, it's all going wrong." <laughs> No, you don't picture God like that. Why not? Because you know more about God. You've already kind of got this idea that God knows what he's doing. But do you picture God as happy? Mm. Yeah, it says he is. It talks about God being... We're going to come on to that, page 188. Mm. But it's linked to this, isn't it? He's, he's perfect in every way. He's also perfectly self-sufficient. Um, if he is really the sum of all conceivable perfections, and there's nothing deficient or lacking in him, there's nothing wrong with God, mm. there's no reason for him to be unhappy. There's no reason for him to be miserable. And you say, but how, but the Bible talks about God being grieved. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, the Bible talks about God being angry. Yeah, that's true. But we've already talked about that. That doesn't mean that God is not always perfectly happy. Huh, how does that work? I don't know. Um, but, but those emotions in God are considered... Um, the, the fact that it's, it's considered that God is using anthropopathisms to help us understand like when it says God was grieved mm. that's attributing human emotions mm. to God God doesn't have human emotions because he's God and he's not human so and God knew the end from the beginning so he knew it was going to happen anyway but somehow, in eternity, God is always eternally, um, perfectly angry with sin and evil and wickedness. And also perfectly happy and content at the same time. You say, how is that possible? It's because he sees the end from the beginning. He knows where he's going. And if you know where you're going... You can be happy painting your picture even when there's mess on the canvas. Mm. You, you don't have to you don't have to kind of worry about what's happening. Mm. And that's really helpful to me because I don't see that. Well, I do believe it, but I don't I don't I don't see it from his perspective, but I can trust that he does. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Questions? All right, let's call it the day. Father, thank you that you're in control, that you're perfectly in control. Thank you that you're happy and perfectly happy. And thank you that we can trust you. And I pray that you'd help us to not think bad thoughts about you just because of the finiteness and um, confusion in our own minds. Lord, we pray that you'd help us always to trust you for who you are. In mm. Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, well, that was the perfection of God. Next, we're going to come on to some of the communicable perfections. <laughs> and the first on the list is spirituality and invisibility. Interesting, mm. all right? Mm. All right, we'll see you next time.